Thank you very much, and uh, my apologies for being late. I'm especially sorry for having missed the, the previous presentations. It may, may mean that I repeat some obvious uh, points that have already been made, so apologies ahead of time for that already. I can report that the Siani offices are crisp and calm this morning. I just took a tour out there, so um, yeah, uh, once again, I'm sorry. Um, I, I have a presentation, yes. Yes. All right, so just while we find my presentation, I will begin by all these uh, uh, sort of mandatory excuses. And I'm an academic researcher. I'm in part by choice quite oblivious to policy thinking at the sort of more substantial level. I try to follow public debates and also more policy related debates on migration, specifically relating to Sub Saharan Africa. But I have to just say from the get go that I'm probably not the best person to provide tools to, for you to work with. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're much more equipped to do that yourselves. So rather than try to do that for you, I'll hopefully provide a different kind of approach to understanding migration. Uh, is, it, uh, I'm sorry. is it underway or should I? All right, then I'll talk a little bit more. I'll skip some slides, so don't worry. Um, yeah, so I've been working mainly in, um, in West Africa. Uh, I began my research in Senegal uh, in 2005, uh, looking at how young men in Dakar articulated their dreams of leaving towards Europe. So 2005 was a time when, for me at least, the first media images of these uh, colorful fishing boats arriving at the, the Canary Islands uh, emerged in, in the European media, and I was fascinated by that, fascinated by that phenomena and wanted to know what motivated uh, young African, especially men at that time, what motivated them to, um, to take that dangerous uh, journey across the sea. Mm. <laughs> she just left. I, <laughs> I have a USB if that's easier. No. All right, it's in the, it's in my bag in the back there. All right, so um, what I realized working with aspiring migrants in, uh, in Dakar was that migration is rarely, even when we would classify it as voluntary, is rarely, thank you, a first choice. Uh, usually people who become migrants, especially undocumented migrants, uh, will have considered and attempted a lot of different ways of making a living and, and sort of moving ahead in life before they attempt that uh, journey. Um, uh, but what I also was constantly reminded, and I think that is a point that is increasingly missed as we try to uh, institutionalize and, and uh, uh, develop policies around migration, what is often forgotten is that, I might just need to find that, thank you, thanks, um, is that migration is a means to an end. It's not often that you hear people um, saying that they aspire to just become migrants, right? They aspire towards something else and migration is seen as an avenue to achieve those aspirations. And I think that should... I'll just jump to something here. I think that should remind us to think uh, holistically about what migration means to the migrants themselves. And I think that and again, it's very easy for me to say, I think that should be uh, uh, taken into account even in policy uh, thinking because there's always a tendency um, when, when policy moves into uh, a new social arena that the categories we use in order to make some kind of order and some kind of, of so platform to, to engage upon, there's always a risk that we... Um, simplify, we need to to some extent, but that we simplify in a way that locks people in particular roles that are not necessarily productive, neither for the migrants themselves in this case, nor for, for uh, the people who are trying to uh, uh, help or, or harness the resources or whatever it might be. So a sort of a more holistic approach to what migration is about is, is one of the points I want to try to bring across. And um, at the Nordic Africa Institute, we organized a uh, uh, and a, a conference last year on African mobilities in that spirit, where we invited 
researchers within a broad array of fields, from the humanities to the social sciences, but also actors uh, uh, from policy uh, uh, an analysis uh, uh, and even maybe some view, um, to discuss what migration means in, in, um, in different ways. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, and thinking holistically about migration, I think, is obviously already part of the policy context. We've seen already in the uh, uh, SDGs that, that migration has become more visible than in, for example, the, the Millennium Development Goals. There is, as you all know, a specific sub-goal, 10.7, uh, specifically addressing uh, the need to regulate um, migration, as was mentioned by the previous speaker. I caught that much of her talk. Um, but there are also other um, goals that are addressed through um, arguing for the need to ensure the human rights of all migrants, uh, regardless of uh, uh, their legal status, um, to recognize the contribution of migration for global sustainable development, to promote international cooperation and to support the right of citizens to return, if that is what they so wish. And of course, this is what was then articulated uh, in the Global Compact pact for migration as as far as i can see again not working in that line of sort of um, uh, policy uh, related work as far as i can see is a, is an ambitious and uh, 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 broad ranging wish list of how um, we globally wish to to ensure uh, the safety and the rights of migrants so i think it's an important step i'm not exactly sure what it will imply in, in practice, uh, but I think it's a very important sort of uh, uh, milestone in articulating uh, uh, this need to respect uh, and ensure the, the hu basic human rights of people, even if they choose to move around a little bit, uh, which is, after all, what migration is, isn't it? Um, so what I want to bring to the discussion today is inspired not by um, uh, vast sort of uh, amounts of, of empirical data. I've just started a new research project uh, which builds on my earlier work, but um, looking at uh, sub-regional migration in West Africa between four countries. Um, and, and I think I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that project which hasn't really resulted in a lot of outputs yet, but I think perhaps some of the conceptual ideas behind it might be interesting for you to take with you or not. Um, so, as a, as a starting point, the, the uh, legal context of, of moving around is obviously quite different in West Africa than it is, say, at the EU level today. Um, there's a long history in West Africa of encouraging the free circulation of labor. Uh, I choose that phrase knowing that that was a, a central sort of uh, slogan at the EU level until the European refugee crisis, right? That one of the benefits of the European Union would be to ensure the free circulation of labor uh, within a regional context. That is already part and parcel of, of um, how West Africa deals with the issue of migration, and it has been for decades, ever since it was formalized in the 1979 uh, protocol relating to the free movement of persons, residents, and establishments. Uh, of course, uh, state intervention and uh, the, the regulation of migration also looks quite different uh, in this context. But what you see here at, in West Africa is that uh, regional migration governance, for example, represented by this protocol, aligns quite well with the practices of migrants themselves. There is a mutual interest in the free circulation of uh, labor. Um, the relative lack of border control, of um, uh, the access to, to identity papers, uh, to uh, any kind of sort of legal documents, uh, is not really in the way of this free circula circulation of labor. So the lack of governance, the lack of uh, public officials on the ground, at least when it comes to uh, the possibility of, of shifting your location, depending on the possibilities, is not a hindrance, it's actually a, uh, an advantage. Just something I find important in, in, in the current sort of debate uh, climate around migration. So that's part of the context that I find interesting. Again, you might have other interests that I could try to elaborate later. But, but more specifically, what I'm interested in now looking at empirically, uh, based on my previous research, but also just uh, um, of, of 
reading up on, on migration in this region, is to look at how aspiring migrant, migrants converge in smaller urban centers to use those urban centers as a platform, a sending platform for other uh, destinations. And I think it happens at all scales. I think it happens from the very uh, micro level up until, the, up until the national level where migrants converge in capital cities, for example, as sending points for, for other destinations that would typically, typically be, be by air, of course. Uh, but So I'm interested in, in uh, small urban centers as nodes for aspiring migrants to seek opportunities, to seek uh, middlemen, etc. And I'm looking at these four uh, towns in West Africa, Bubujolasso in Burkina Faso, I could have done that in a more clear way, Bubujolasso in Burkina Faso, Korogo in Ivory Coast, uh, Sikasso in Mali, and uh, Kankan in uh, Guinea. And of course, this region has a long history of many different kinds of movements, um, even dating back, back way back before uh, the colonial period. And uh, you had trade, trading routes, you had um, whole societies moving uh, in reaction to uh, uh, changes in, in the, um, the environmental conditions because of, of warfare, etc. Uh, you had large scale movements as well as individual migrants making their ways across this territory, and you've had so for centuries. Um, I could say a bit more, but I won't since I might already be uh, blabbing on too much. Uh, but, but obviously, um, the kinds of or the purpose uh, of these um, movements are very diverse. Uh, and I want to make a couple of, of observations about which predominant kinds of migration people engage in and also the ways in which they are diverse. So obviously you have different kinds of, of agricultural uh, laborers moving around looking for uh, new f uh, uh, land to, to uh, farm on their own, but also to work, for example, in the southern uh, plantation belt uh, uh, towards the, the coast. Um, you have um, longer and shorter moves and you have people doing that not just to farm, but also to engage in small trade. Uh, there's a, a growing sector of artisanal mining here. You see miners moving from different, uh, moving to uh, different mining sites in this sub-region, bringing their uh, specialized technologies with, with them into new territory, uh, taking advantage of booms in specific mines and then moving on when that is necessary. So this is a very dynamic, very fluid field of, of mobility. Um, and I think uh, I would dare make the statement without really knowing it, that it is fairly unregulated by any state actors. I think there are attempts to, to regulate uh, at least some of these sectors, but in general I would venture the claim that people figure out how to move around, where to go, how to go there, what to do there, pretty much on the basis of their own social networks. And that is something I want to bring to the table here. Um, in my earlier research, well, right, and then of course there's a whole transportation industry which is really booming in this region, uh, bringing migrants back and forth. So you see uh, bus companies from, from these fairly small minibuses to, to sort of big commercial uh, bus companies uh, really blossoming in, in this uh, region because there is a, a de demand for that kind of movement. Uh, I've, I've looked uh, previously as well at uh, mobile combatants, so people moving from one war to the other as a labor force, uh, looking for the next job opportunity within their specialized fields. I don't want to glorify that line of work, I just want to say that it's also uh, a line of labor migration, you could call it that, uh, because people rarely fight out of uh, necessarily a strong ideological uh, conviction. They fight because it's a livelihood, um, at least at the lower ranks. Um, so that kind of mobile labor force is also present in this region. And we have now uh, uh, the conflict in Mali. We have um, increasing instability in Burkina Faso, which might potentially be labor markets for regional combatants as well. So these are, I think, some of the predominant uh, uh, fields of work that are relevant to migrants uh, uh, in this region. And the, the um, variation in this migration scenario that I want to emphasize as well is that the same person might be um, in, in gen, um, inventive and um, adaptive enough to jump from one sector to the others. So in my research in this region, I've talked to people who are uh, investing in small scale trade in the city, contemplating joining the, their uncle across the border on a farm. 
getting into agricultural labor. Uh, I'll talk more about some of the sort of uh, cultural idioms uh, dividing the rural and the urban in many of these contexts in a little bit, but I just want to emphasize that uh, the same goes, for, by the way, for combatant recruitment. Most uh, combatants I've spoken to were doing something completely different before they became soldiers. They were uh, carpenters or, or yeah, whatever they might have been. Uh, so there's a lot of, of um, flexibility. There's a strength in people's capacity to adapt to the labor market at the local level that I think it is, is important to, to remember. Do you want to give me like a five minute? I guess I'm already there. Or five, yeah? Okay. Um, okay. I realize that the focus here is on rural development, and I have a bit, I'll have a bit to say about that um, before I end. But the reason why I'm interested in these smaller urban centers was sort of restated recently by um, a working group under the OECD. Uh, and th they have designed this project called Africopolis. I have never heard anyone representing them say that. Africa Polis? I don't know. Africa. Yeah. Um, which emphasizes that the vast majority of urban centers uh, in Africa are smaller, are secondary cities, are not the capital cities. And that in uh, urban research as well as in uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, development policy, we tend to focus on either the rural in a fairly sort of categorical way or the urban as represented by these larger cities, sometimes mega cities uh, across the continent. And that is not to say that the larger cities are not important, it's just to say that there's a whole area of thinking about how people look at opportunities uh, in urban centers that might miss the point that the vast majority of urban centers are have uh, um, a population of under 300,000 300, inhabitants. So people may look out, uh, seek out these smaller secondary cities uh, as, a, as a recruitment platform or um, as, as a, a place to find middlemen, etc. So I think these smaller urban centers are becoming increasingly uh, important and visible uh, in both research and potentially in, in policy thinking as well. Um, when talking about regional migration uh, at this level and sort of uh, choosing to, to spend fairly uh, limited attention to the policy and, and sort of uh, um, regulation context, what becomes important in understanding how people move is obviously different kinds of infrastructure. What is it that enables people to move around in, in this context where it's fairly easy to cross borders, it's, um, it's also something that people have to do on their own. Um, Infrastructures implies both sort of the hard infrastructures of roads, rail, uh, railways, and also transportation possibilities like that, uh, like we see sort of represented here from Lagos in Nigeria. Um, but infrastructures, and as an anthropologist, this is what is particularly interesting to me, is also about uh, the, the softer infrastructures, the connections, the social networks, uh, the knowledge, the ideas that shape people's aspirations and abilities to move. Uh, so beyond just the concrete and the steel that makes the pathways uh, uh, that migrants travel along, I think it's important to acknowledge the softer infrastructures of what actually enables the individual to, to get up and, and go somewhere. And I could have done this much more uh, complex and messy, but I want to emphasize uh, uh, transnational family connections. I think that's fairly relevant uh, also outside the African context. Um, I've, I've looked into how flexible people are in ascribing kinship even, sorry, right, kinship even to people they are not biologically related to. And I think it means to me that uh, other, other important uh, people in people's lives matter. So friends, uh, uh, business partners, etc., cetera, um, shape the way people envisage uh, a migration trajectory and how they're able to implement it also. Um, in the literature on, mi on migration, especially outside Africa, is it like two minutes or a half or where do you want me to? Um, there's a lot of attention to brokers, to uh, middlemen. And of course, this has come up also in relation to the refugee crisis around the Mediterranean. We're looking at the traffickers, the smugglers, etc., as we usually refer to them. But there's a whole, not, not a regulated industry, but there's a whole uh, labor market for people who are able to uh, uh, be middle men and women of, of migration movements at the local level as well. Uh, so that's not, it's, it's, a, it's a, an occupation and it is also an important actor to think about when we think about what it is that makes people move. Uh, this I think I will skip. Um, 
Right. So I have worked mainly in, in and on urban contexts, and, and it's a bit of a stretch for me to speculate about sort of the rural context in and of itself. I'm sure that many of you here know much more and perhaps could relate to some of the things I've been trying to say here. Um, what I see from, looking, from, from working with urban youth during the past 10 years or so in different countries um, is, of course, that uh, young people are often the ones most willing, young, young men and women are the ones most willing to uh, uh, venture into the unknown or to uh, seek out relatives or other connections elsewhere in order to get ahead, to just make a change for themselves and potentially benefit to their uh, families, perhaps even their communities. So young people and youth mobilities, I think, would be an, a, a central uh, uh, factor that, that needs to be uh, thought about and harnessed uh, in thinking about how migration uh, might contribute uh, more to, to development uh, in different ways. Um, on that note, I also want to say that, that you know, uh, there was a question before about so what are the positive sides of, of migration. There are a lot of problems uh, re related to migration, especially today. And I would say that even the Global Compact for Migration takes a point of departure in many of the downsides, many of the risks we want to avoid, uh, the, the rights we want to ensure, etc. Uh, I would say that a very easy answer is that migration is by far, and I have no figures whatsoever to back this up, by far a more positive force than it is a negative one. Even when people move uh, because they have no other choice, most migrants are able to make the best of those circumstances. Uh, what I would argue is often the problem is the regulation around migration that inhibits people to work, to study, uh, to travel onwards, etc. But I would say that by far, especially when you look outside Europe and when you look at the local level, migration is already uh, part of the toolkit that people uh, use to, to invest in their own livelihoods and those of their families. I would be happy to try to substantiate that <laughs> if, if you're interested. Um, I have to uh, uh, round up here. So what I'm sort of implicitly arguing against here, trying to move beyond, is, to, is this idea of migration as a, a, a constant sense of crisis, as, as a problem that we need to uh, regulate our way out of. I think that uh, above and beyond and despite of all the interventions we are seeing against uh, migration in different parts of the world, migrants themselves are the resource that we could choose to tap into more constructively. They are already there, they're already doing the work we're looking for despite the regulatory efforts to stem them or inhibit them. So that on a very sort of general level, I think that is from my strange corner of, of this big complex issue, uh, my main point I would say, it is to remember that migration is a means to an end. Uh, we don't need to fixate people in the role of being a migrant. I came here from Denmark 10 years ago, and obviously I speak about migration daily, but I would prefer not to just be seen as a migrant. And because of the predominant ideas and idioms around migration, and because of the color of my skin, I'm rarely thought of as a migrant. Uh, so there are political, cultural, social dynamics that keep certain categories of migrants in place as migrants, whereas the rest of us are, are allowed to move on and do more interesting things that just talk about where we came from at some point in our lives. Um, I hope I have just very superficially evoked the diversity of and the adaptability when it comes to migrants' own uh, capacities to, to shift sectors, to move around, to look out the opportunities where they are. Um, and in terms of, of governance, I would say that um, although uh, the Global Compact for Migration has a lot of potential as a, as a stepping stone or as a benchmark for talking about migrants' rights, I would say that more emphasis on migrants as workers and in need of workers' rights rather than just rights to move uh, would be a productive way of aligning migration policy with other fields of, of uh, le uh, legislation and uh, policy investment. Uh, so, yeah, so what I'm trying to say, I guess, is that migrants are already development entrepreneurs and I think that uh, with uh, some adjustments to the way we tend to perceive the role of migration globally today and in developing contexts in particular, I think that resource could be harnessed uh, much more effectively. Thank you.